Hello and welcome to our Good Friday service. Whether you are listening and watching as a regular attender at Grimsby Baptist Church or you are tuning in for the first time, wherever you are in the world, you are most welcome. Although the church building might be closed, Grimsby Baptist Church, a body of God's worshipping people, is very much not closed. We are seeking to reach out, to care for people, to look after people and support people. We are also continuing to reach out to share the good news of Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Good news that everyone needs to hear. The Good Friday service is traditionally a reflective service and a meditative one. When we are reminded of the events of that Friday over 2,000 years ago, on a hill outside the city of Jerusalem, where Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross, where he hung until he died. And as we reflect, we are reminded that this death was unlike any other death. This death was a defining point in all human history and all human future. And so we are thankful for Nick Murray as he leads us through this service and brings us reflections from chapter 19 of John's Gospel, recounting to us the final words of Jesus on the cross. We are thankful too for the worship team and their time and preparation putting this service together. And for Hannah Willett, who is a church member and also a student at Moreland's Bible College, who will be reading God's word to us. Well, this is a strange Good Friday service. All of us separated and isolated from each other. But I do hope that as we engage in these short reflections, that we can begin to know and understand that because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, that first Good Friday, we can enter into relationship with him and never be separated from him, whatever the circumstances. My name's Nick Murray. I'm an ordinand in training for ministry with the Church of England at Cram Hall in County Durham. And it's a real privilege to have been invited to speak to you this Good Friday. Uh, we will be looking together at the account of Jesus' death given to us by John's Gospel in chapter 19. Uh, we're going to be paying close attention to three things that Jesus says there from the cross. But could I encourage you to read the whole chapter today? Spend some time reading it and rereading it, pausing and holding in your mind the details and phrases that John so carefully recorded for us. But before we go any further, let's pray. God, our Father, as we join together in this strange way to think again of the cross where Jesus died, would you be working in our hearts by your Spirit? Would you be stirring in us to consider again the significance of this moment in, the history, in our history when Jesus died? Would you bring home to us while we are in our homes the depths Jesus went to for us and for our salvation? As we listen, would you remove all distractions from us so we can sit, as it were, at the foot of the cross? And Lord, we are aware that there may be a broader audience than would be if we'd met in church. Would you rule over the things that are said and the songs that are sung so that hearts and minds and lives of all of us watching and listening can be captured by the height and depth and width of your love for our world and find our place in your kingdom. We're going to start by having our first song sung to us, Oh to See the Dawn. Calvary 
tried by sinful man, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame. John chapter 19 verses 16 through to the end. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. The crucifixion. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, 
and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Madeline. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. The death of Jesus. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus's side is pierced. Since it was a day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Jesus is buried. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and, it, and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they lay Jesus there. I've noticed that mothers and sons have a particular relationship. It, it's not a universal truth, but there is, I think, a connection between mothers and sons that I don't think is quite the same between mothers and daughters. I've seen it in my son's relationship to his mum. There's a closeness, an affection that he seems to enjoy and to some extent need, and so does his mum. I'm not saying that daughters don't have this, but there is some intangible, qualitative difference with sons and their mothers, I think. I also think as sons grow up and perhaps become husbands and fathers or take on responsibilities of adult life in whatever way that their mothers can feel somewhat rejected. They are no longer the person that their son goes through first thing in the morning for a cuddle or a kiss, and they remember that so fondly. They are no longer the person that their son shares everything with. They are further down the pecking order of his life. His partner, his work, his children, his friends, all seem to get in before her, and that hurts. She could have helped him, if only he'd have listened. And mothers perhaps irk their adult sons by reminding them of their siblings' birthdays or other key family events that would otherwise have passed their son by in the busyness of work, relationships and family life. Doesn't she know? I can't be phoning her every week at that time. Why didn't why did she phone then? Didn't she know that I wouldn't have even had my dinner by that time? But 
there often remains a connectedness, a need, I think, for each other somewhere, a rootedness uh, in knowing that your mother always loves you. But sons are not supposed to die before their mothers. The arms that cradled new life are not supposed to cradle their dead, beloved child. Mothers are supposed to give life to their sons, not watch helplessly as their life they gave their son. A life that held so much promise, so much potential, drains slowly, painfully away before their very eyes. Jesus' words to his mother perhaps reflect that he knows she cannot bear the sight and will need someone to look after her in the coming days. He addresses her in a particular way, a way he had used before. Did he want her to remember? Did he want her to recall another time he'd used the same phrase, the same name? A phrase that showed his deep, loving bond with her, the special place she had in his earthly life. He'd called her in this way before, when he'd turned water into wine at the wedding in Canaan all those years ago. People in the village were still talking about it. The couple still lived in the village and were celebrities, still being asked if they could, if they had any more of that last batch of the good stuff or knew where it came from. He had met her need that day. He'd been a good son. He'd not just met her need and the need of that couple and the need of all those guests. But he exceeded expectations with an abundance, an exuberance of wine. So much of it was spilt that they were mopping it up for days. And now his blood was being poured out like that wine had been poured out. And it was being poured out to meet her need again. A need I'm not sure she knew she had a need to know her son but not as she had known him so far but as the son whose death would bring life and love more abundant more exuberant more fulfilling than any son could ever bring many of us think we know jesus the great teacher, the miracle worker, the great exemplar of a good life. But do we really know him? Do we really know why he died on the cross? And what good is knowing him anyway in the face of COVID-19 and all the horrors that we face right now? When we can't be with those we love and can't live the lives we want to, but Jesus calls us, lovingly calls us, as he called Mary, to remind us, to prompt us, to begin to see him for who he really is. we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience.
patience would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Riches of kindness He lavished on us His blood was the payment His life was the cost We stood neath the debt We could never afford Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness If you've been around churches for the last 250 years, you, you'd probably come across the song, As the Deer Pants. Um, you know the one. As the deer pants for the water, so might eat. <sighs> Many people like it. The um, song uh, evokes a kind of beautiful pastoral scene. A, a deer gambles down to a still pool of water and laps from it in a beautiful green glade with bright sunshine. But the image comes from the psalm, Psalm 42, and in that psalm the scene's a lot more desperate. Um, the deer, like the author of the psalm, is in a really bad place, um, a point near death. The pool that the deer has travelled many miles to get to has, we imagine, dried up in the scorching sun. Every blade of grass has withered, wilted and died. The deer we should evoke from this psalm has its ribs sticking out. It's stumbling around deranged from heat stroke and injured from its travels. It's an ugly scene. A scene with death crouching, ready to strike, and vultures circling overhead. The song we sing seems to fall short of that depiction for some reason, and perhaps because all too often we try to insulate ourselves from pain and sorrow. The pain and sorrow that sometimes just crouches a little too near our doors for comfort. I've been struck recently by the media's presentation of the Nightingale Hospitals, which is presented in many ways like a good news story, a story of hope 
perhaps in an unfolding and deeply disturbing tragedy that is COVID-19. But it strikes me that we struggle to keep our focus on the concern and the pain and the suffering that is taking place in many people's lives right now. Pain and suffering that may well be taking place or may well take place in all of our lives in the weeks ahead. We prefer not to watch the news or at least try not to watch it too often and try to see the good that will come out of this, as someone said to me recently. Jesus' cry from the cross, his I thirst, tells us that he did not look away. He did not try to insulate himself from the horror that is all too often human experience. He did not try to see the good or shut himself up in heaven safely to avoid dealing with the cost of our human rebellion. His cry tells us that God in Jesus really did suffer, really did know pain, really did know hurt. He, like so many people today, was dying alone without any of his loved ones around him. Unlike us, he chose to willingly bear the weight of our human rebellion against God that is the cause of all our pain. We have chosen, you see, to live life the way we want to. We have decided that we know best, that we are able to do what we want when we want it. We have made ourself our God. And in our rejection of God and his ways, we have been looking for water to drink in a desert. The pools of water we told ourselves would sustain us and satisfy us, our work, our relationships, our leisure, our pleasure, our families, our religious observance. Well, they have all dried up and brought us to this wilderness. When Jesus cries out, when he cries out, I thirst, I think at least in part, it's because he has drunk from the waters of our human rebellion and our sin. He has tasted the ways that we have sought to replace God. And they do not satisfy. There is no life in them. Without knowing the source of all life. When Jesus cries out, I thirst, we're supposed to remember water being turned into wine in John chapter 2. A near lifetime supply of wine that that couple could drink and could possibly have never thirsted again. But he is thirsty now. We are supposed to remember when Jesus talked to the woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4. He promised her a perpetual spring of living water if she trusted in him. But Jesus is thirsty now. And we are supposed to remember the incident in John chapter 7, where the high, 
at the high point of the Feast of Tabernacles, where the priest ceremonially pours water on the steps of the temple as a symbolic reminder of a time when God's people were living in the wilderness and had no water to drink. That God provided their need through Moses striking the rock. And at that point, as the priest pours the water, as they were all watching this ceremony, were told that Jesus shouts with a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. But the one who promised to be the perpetual source the one who turned water to wine, the one who declared that he could quench thirst, is thirsty now. Thirsty because he is dying. In exchange give us living water to give us the deep nourishing waters of reliance on and in an all satisfying relationship with god he's exchanging our waters of human rebellion that have turned out to be dried up riverbeds that never give us what they promise in exchange for the living waters that he knows. You see, he was thirsty so that we don't have to be. He was thirsty so that we can face uncertainty. As we face the hardships that are coming, and they have already come. We can know that Jesus knows the depths of our hurt, the depths of our suffering, the depths of our fears, and our longing for safety. Because he was thirsty, we can know that it is only in knowing him we can have our thirst quenched and in thirst's place is the soul satisfying water of significance and relationship with God our Father that he gave up so we could drink and when we drink, we find we can keep our focus, even in the midst of human tragedies. sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus Hallelujah, praise. 
praise and honor unto Thee. Sent of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile. Sometimes when the kids were little, I would get them to wash the car. They liked doing it. It wasn't slave labour or anything. And they would all go out and wash the car. And I would try and stand back and let them. That often meant that they got very wet, but the car remained very dry. The kids, having finished washing the car, would run into the house and shout, it's finished! At which point they would expect Joy and I to rummage around and find some money from somewhere and give them their pocket money so that they could run off to the shops and uh, buy some sweets. The problem was that the kids were just not very good at washing the car. You see, washing the car would give the kids something to do when Joy and I had run out of all the other ideas and just needed a cup of tea. But their washing of the car normally resulted in me having to wash the car. And often to do it without them noticing. On one occasion, one of them found me washing the car after they had finished and said, Daddy, what are you doing? We had finished it! And um, before walking off, before I could even explain what on earth was going on. Their car washing meant I had to pay for it twice. I had to pay for it in the form of some finding some money, and I had to pay for it in the form of my time and energies. So what actually happened when they washed the car was that I got poorer financially and poorer with my time. And I still had a dirty car that I had to finish. But the kids, 
they got to know that they had helped and they got the benefit of having some pocket money which they could go to the shops with and buy some sweets or save up or do something with. They also got Joy and I thanking them and telling them that they'd done a really good job. But the truth was that their efforts were never really good enough. In fact, they usually made the car look a lot worse and a lot messier than it ever did before. But they had wanted to help. They had tried to serve and do a good thing, but they were just unable to do it. Good Friday is a reminder to me that just like my kids trying to wash the car, and trying really hard. I can never earn my way into God's presence. My best efforts seem to make more of a mess than if I hadn't tried at all. In fact, the more I try to follow Jesus' example, the more I try to do, to live life as he sets out in his teachings, the more I realise that I simply cannot live like he did. Can you imagine if I had tried to make my kids wash the car really well? Perhaps I could have stood over them, pointed out where they had missed the dirty bits and got them to do it again. Made sure they'd rinsed out the sponges and basically got them to do it properly. But it would have been no good. My expectations, my instructions would have crushed them. They would have come out of that resenting me, perhaps even hating me. They certainly would not have enjoyed it or wanted to do it all over again next week. And I would have damaged my relationship with them. But on a whole nother level, what would have been worse still is that if I had insisted on them washing the car over and over again until they got it right. Or made them copy me and my example as I washed the car and made them do that over and over again until they got it right. I wouldn't have just ended up damaging my relationship with my children. I, I would have alienated them. I would have run the risk of making them feel worthless. My kids were just unable to do the job. My example, my instructions, my guidance would have been all well and good, but they would never have produced a sense of, of, of pride of pleasure that my kids got from washing the car. It would certainly not have produced a, a desire to do it all again next week. And they wouldn't have had the delight of having just a few pounds of their own money to spend as they liked, often by buying a treat for their mum or dad. It would have not it wouldn't have been something that made them love me. What they needed, if they were going to get any sense of pride or enjoyment from washing the car, was for me to take their place. For me to do the work for them, to pay the cost in terms of money to give to them and time to do it again to bear the weight of the job for them. To do it without them even understanding that I was doing it for them because of the mess that they had made. And to do it at the risk of making them cross with me. To finish it for them. At the cross, God, in and through Jesus, did for us what we could never do for ourselves. At the cross, Jesus 
willingly took the responsibility for our human rebellion and our rejection of God. He did the work. He paid the cost. He carried the weight. And without us even understanding why, he died in our place, paying the price we should have paid. He finished it all so that we can enter into the pleasure of God's presence. So that we could offer up our best efforts to God our Father and know his pleasure, his delight in us. So we could avoid being crushed by the weight of Jesus' example or the expectations of God's holiness so that we could know we are forgiven, we are loved, we are cherished, we are wanted by the sovereign God of the universe. Not because we are special, not because we have some worth of our own, but simply because God wants all his creation to know him and enjoy him forever. As we close these reflections, let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you that he died in our place. We want to thank you that he stepped in to the place that was rightly ours for our rebellion, for our rejection of you, for our enthronement of self when we should have enthroned you. Father, in the midst of all that's going on in our world today, would this Good Friday be a special Good Friday for us? A Good Friday where we learn something of what it is to put you back in the place you rightly deserve in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. Father, would you glorify Jesus, your son, in our world now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining in with these reflections. I hope and trust that they have been meaningful for you. If things in them have uh, impacted on you, perhaps you might want to get in contact with somebody in the church to just talk things through a little bit further. Before we finish with our final song of worship today, let's just spend a few moments in quiet prayer and reflection on what we've heard and been challenged on from God's word today. Thinking of what it means for us, for the people that we love and care about, for our neighbours and colleagues, for people across the world. Bringing them to God in prayer who knows our deepest needs and longs for us to listen to him. And whilst we pray, there will be a short piece of instrumental music before we move into our final song.
depths I cry to you. In darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew. And hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sin? come before your throne, yet full forgiveness meets my gaze, I stand redeemed by grace alone. Why? 
satisfied. I will wait for you. I will wait for you through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you. For your love is my delight. A final prayer as we finish. Father God, on this Good Friday, we recognise and give thanks again that you gave your only Son to die in our place, to take the punishment for our sin, the punishment that we rightly and justly deserved. You did this to rescue and redeem people who have without exception turned their backs on you, rejected you, cursed you and sinned against you. And yet despite this, your love is greater, your mercy is greater. And in the cross we see how your anger at sin and your perfect justice was completely satisfied. And in the cross we see the only way that we can be forgiven and saved. Father, we thank you and worship you for your love. Father, for all who have watched and listened to this service today, who perhaps for the first time have seen what Good Friday is really about, I pray that they would see Jesus for who he really is and would turn from sin and would come to him as Lord and Saviour and King, trusting completely in your promise that all who do will be saved. Amen. Thank you for watching. Can I encourage you, as Nick exhorted us to, to read and reflect on John chapter 19? And on our website, there are some questions for further reflection and discussion that Nick has kindly prepared based on today's sermon. And if you have any questions at all, please contact us through our church Facebook page or website. The details for these will come up after this video as well as details of the Christianity Explored website, which has a series of short videos answering some of life's tough questions and helping to explain more about Christianity. Thanks again for watching.